everyone. I have to inform you that the event is being recorded. So, and it will be published on YouTube afterwards. I am Jan Vesilopoulos, an undergraduate student at the History and Philosophy of Science Department of the University of Athens. Today, I'm pleased to welcome you to the roundtable discussion, Philosophers as Public Intellectuals, hosted by the Fourth Panhellenic Undergraduate Philosophy Conference. As the title of the discussion suggests, we will engage in what is broadly referred to as public philosophy. And to grasp the essence of it, one can bring to mind the allegory of the cave. We can imagine two paths for the philosopher who escapes the cave. The first path, they leave, never to look back and continue the search for the truth, just for the sake of it. The second path, they might also leave for a bit, but then get back to the cave and try to set the others free, persuade them out of the cave. One could say that what happens with academic philosophy today looks more like the former, and one could also argue that it should look more like the latter. As this is a topic that we, the organizing committee of the conference, hold close to our hearts, we are delighted to have with us three of the most knowledgeable, influential and active scholars on the matter to discuss it further. Anastasia Berg, Assistant Professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Agnes Callard, Associate Professor at the University of Chicago, and Justin Weinberg, Associate Professor at the University of South Carolina. The three of them are researching different topics of philosophy, but share this common interest for public philosophy in which they have also contributed with their writings and public talks. Professor Berg is a senior editor at The Point magazine, for which he also writes, along with The New York Times and The Chronicle of Higher Education Review. Professor Callard maintains a monthly column at The Point magazine and writes for The New York Times philosophy series, The Stone. She also organizes and participates in the Night Talks events, a series of late night philosophy conversations at the University of Chicago. And Professor Weinberg is the editor of the Daily News, a news and discussion site for matters related to academic philosophy. He writes ex extensively on public philosophy at the Daily News, as well as on his personal blog, we disagree. Once again, we're grateful to have you. Um, just letting you know, as we said before, you can raise your hand by the end of the conversation, which will last about an hour. And uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for being here and in accepting our invitation. We can uh, begin with uh, Professor Weinberg. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. and It's uh, great to see such a large audience here. Um, I think maybe I'll just speak initially to the metaphor of the cave that you, you started with. Uh, you, you left out one option, and I think it's the option that I'm going to be pursuing in, in my brief remarks today, which is that the, the philosopher's job is to show people that the cave is much bigger than they might have thought, um, with lots of different parts uh, to it. So uh, I'll begin uh, by noting that uh, we're probably in the golden age of public philosophy. Uh, there's more philosophers, more well-trained philosophers who are doing more public facing activity in a greater variety of formats for larger and more diverse audiences than ever before. And I, mean, I think there's a good reason that I'm the opening act here because my co-panelists have done actually a, a lot more public philosophy writings and engagements I think than I have. I've done a little bit here and there, but my role has largely been, I think, different uh, while I've done some public philosophy events and stuff, but my role has largely been to normalize, I think, public philosophy to some extent uh, through daily news by talking about it a lot and promoting it and showing that this is something that a lot of uh, good philosophers are doing. Uh, daily news is aimed largely at uh, other philosophers, although sometimes we also do have uh, public philosophy on there for non-philosophers. Okay, so there's this question about what public philosophy should do, and I think there are, there are different ways to understand that question. Um, one is about the forms that public philosophy could take, and I don't really have something to say about that. It's wonderful how many different kinds of forms public philosophy takes, videos, podcasts, summer camps, uh, as well as columns in newspapers and magazines, um, parties and events, festivals. It's really, really amazing. Uh, I'm more concerned with the substantive interpretation of this question of what should public philosophy do. And there, there are different ways to interpret that question as well. One is about topics and um, for, you know, do philosophy about everything. Um, but, but another is what philosophers should be aiming to convey to the public or do with the public in regard to the philosophical subjects that they're talking about. So when I ask what should philosophers do, I'm, I'm focusing on that. Um, now, when we're doing public philosophy, uh, we might think that, that most of the people doing public philosophy do it because they think it's worth doing. Um, 
they think uh, public philosophy is valuable. And we might think that anyone who thinks that public philosophy is valuable also thinks that philosophy is valuable. Right? It's not necessarily the case. You know, maybe it's just you know, public philosophy is their job and they don't really care about philosophy, but this is how they're making the big bucks. Um, but I think most people who do public philosophy think it's valuable because they think philosophy is valuable. Um, and and what makes public philosophy valuable, at least in part, has something to do with the value that philosophy has. So I think a good question, if we're thinking about what the role of public philosophers are, uh, if we're thinking about that question, a, a good sub-question there is, of course, this enormous big metaphilosophical question, what's philosophy valuable for? for? <laughs> and how should we figure that out? There are lots of plausible answers. Um, here's one schematic way. Uh, we might think that the value of some activity uh, is related to something that the activity is typically typically good at producing or typically good at. Um, that sounds pretty good. There's going to be some counterexamples to that kind of thing. Um, and we want to be careful about when we say that something is valuable, it's valuable in a way that's related to what it does because things like torture are very good at creating pain and we don't want to say that thereby, you know, torture is good because it, I'm sorry, that uh, creating pain is good necessarily. We don't want to, we don't want to be uh, on the hook for that. So we might clarify things. We might say this, the value of some activity in general is something that the activity is typically good at, provided that what that acti activity is typically good at is itself valuable. Um, now that's better, also not immune to counterexamples. Uh, so we might take a negative tack, sort of turn it around a little bit and we say this, well, maybe it's hard to identify what the value of some activity is, but it's probably not something that that activity is typically bad at um, or, you know, or bad at producing. Um, it would be odd to say that the value of construction work is relaxation because construction work isn't really relaxing. It would be uh, odd to say that um, the value of reading is physical fitness, right? I mean, sometimes the books are super heavy, but you know, that's not usually a typical thing that reading does. Um, so what about philosophy? What is philosophy bad at producing? Uh, here's some answers. Uh, chocolate cake, all right? No matter how much philosophy I do after hours of reading and writing, there is just never a chocolate cake that I've created as a result of all that, okay? Uh, peace on earth, right? Philosophers have been doing philosophy for a long time. The entire time there have been human conflicts. Philosophers have failed at achieving peace on earth. What else have, are philosophers bad at? Um, coming, by the way, to a settled body of knowledge consisting of correct answers to philosophical questions. We're really bad at that too. Uh, almost as bad as I think making chocolate cake. Um, so, What's the evidence for this last idea that philosophers are typically, that philosophy is kind of bad at producing uh, a settled body of knowledge consisting of answers to philosophical questions? Uh, one body of evidence is the history of philosophy, right? Uh, it's full of disagree disagreement, but uh, of course there is contemporary disagreement. There's lots of disagreement amongst living philosophers. Some of you may be familiar with the Phil Papers survey, which asks philosophers living now various kinds of questions. And as the results reveal, they, you know, we, we disagree quite a bit over uh, a lot of big philosophical questions. And sometimes we disagree over very fundamental matters. Uh, back in 2009, it was 50-50 on the law of non-contradiction. You know, so you thought like, okay, something like that is gonna be, we're all gonna agree with that, but uh, so. Actually, if, if anything, you know, they did a new round of the Phil Paper survey just recently and they haven't re re revealed the results yet, but I would imagine that uh, there might be more agreement on that logical question because I think non-classical logics have only gotten more popular over the last decade. Um, okay, so if the value of some activity is probably not something that that activity is typically bad at producing, then the value of philosophy is probably not in the production of correct answers to philosophical questions. And if the value of philosophy is probably not in the production of correct answers to philosophical questions, and if the value of public philosophy is in some way dependent on the value of philosophy, then the value of public philosophy is probably not in the production of or advocacy for correct answers to philosophical questions, right? Just as the value of public philosophy could not be in its production of chocolate cake. 
All right, so I guess the first point you know, to summarize here would be that I've made a kind of wishy-washy argument for the claim that public philosophy is probably not valuable because of the production or spread or advocacy or sharing of the answers to philosophical questions. That said, right, despite what I've said before about philosophical disagreement, uh, lack of consensus, and that philosophy is, is bad at producing a settled body of knowledge consisting of answers to philosophical questions, philosophers are very much attracted to answers. Um, so David Chalmers uh, says, uh, I think, this is a quote from him, I think a case can be made that attaining the truth is the primary aim, at least of many parts of philosophy, such as analytic philosophy. After all, most philosophy, or at least most analytic philosophy, consists in putting forward theses as true and arguing for their truth. I suspect that for the majority of philosophers, the primary motivation in doing philosophy is to figure out the truth about the relevant subject areas. And he goes on to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I don't think that Chalmers is wrong about that. I, I think he's, he's right that this is a fairly widespread view that philosophers have about the part of the value of their own work. Uh, after all, many articles and books are written full of arguments that are defending answers as correct to specific philosophical questions. Um, now, I'm, I'm not gonna go too much into depth there. I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time talking. I think that a lot of the value of our session will come in, in the questions, but um, it, I think it's, it's just enough to note that this is a widespread view, even amongst philosophy's expert practitioners that philosophy is about importantly about getting the answers. Um, it's widespread among students too. Some of you may be philosophy professors, some of you may be students, and you may, uh, well, if you're a professor, you might have heard this from your students, or if you're a student, you might have said this uh, at the end of class, how can we never get any answers to the questions in this class, right? Uh, as a complaint, saying that as a kind of complaint, or, you know, I walk in the door and I uh, have some questions and I leave with even more questions. And these are things that are phrased as kinds of complaints. Um, the idea that intellectual inquiry is successful when we get the answers is I think fairly prevalent. Uh, and it's not confined to philosophy. Um, there are many areas of intellectual inquiry that are in fact good at providing answers to their own questions. Uh, math, uh, medicine, computer science, biology, chemistry, and so on. There's a lot of really good answer production going on there, and it's no surprise that philosophy um, might be feeling that kind of pressure too to hold itself up to that standard. But I, I do think that that standard is a kind of mistake, uh, what we might call the answer trap. Um, when philosophy is judged by the criteria of producing consensus on correct answers, it, it does badly. Um, and if the standard for what makes a certain kind of intellectual inquiry or enterprise valuable is its ability to answer questions, then philosophers are doing badly according to this important criteria. Um, and we see sometimes the result of this kind of thinking where people think, well, philosophy isn't worth doing or any answer is as good as any other or it's all bullshit anyway, or there's no such thing as philosophical expertise. Right? This idea that um, philosophy isn't this kind of thing that is a serious intellectual enterprise because of the disagreement about the answers. But why should we judge philosophy according to criteria that concern something philosophy is not typically good at doing, right? That is producing answers. We wouldn't think it appropriate to judge philosophy by how well it produces chocolate cake. And I think likewise, we ought not to judge philosophy by how well it is, uh, how, how, well, how good a job it does at producing um, answers to philosophical questions. Um, so I think philosophers should be more active in rejecting answer production as the criteria by which philosophy is judged uh, and ought to reject the idea that the sole or primary value of intellectual inquiry is the production of correct answers. Uh, so we might ask, well, if not answers, then what? What's the point of all this questioning? What is, what is philosophy good for if not the production of these answers? Well, we could say, well, it's good for the production of the questions. That's one thing, right? And this is something I've said elsewhere, but I think it's worth re reiterating that um, when philosophical questions are good, 
what they do is they point out what we don't know. And it's very valuable to learn what it is that we don't know. Uh, after all, the first step in learning something is learning that we don't know it. Uh, and so a metaphor that I often use to uh, convey the value of philosophical question is that philosophy is map making uh, and the territory is the unknown. So philosophy is this mapping of the unknown. Maps are useful. When you go out there, we find out where the landmarks are, what the lay of the land is, so on, so we can figure out where we need to go. Likewise, right? philosophers with their questions, each question is a dot on that map that says, this is something we don't know. And as philosophy goes into different areas, the map expands. As the questions lead to more questions, we get more dots on that map. We can have the roads and the routes and the paths on there maybe represent the assumptions and arguments, premises and conclusions that themselves generate further questions. Right? And we put the dots on there. Uh, and so if we see philosophy uh, and philosophical questioning as a kind of preliminary map building, and if we think that maps to the unknown can be valuable, then we have an explanation of in, well, at least one aspect of the value of in philosophical inquiry. Um, so I think I think I do think that this mapping this territory of the unknown is a, is a quite valuable enterprise. And we can talk more about that in the question, in the question and answers. There's practical value too, right? Because once we learn that that cave is much bigger than we thought it was, this cave of, uh, of ignorance, um, then it, it might lead to a bit of intellectual humility. And we and while I won't argue for that right now, we might think that there is some value uh, to intellectual humility. Uh, and philosophers can see themselves as the scouts or guides that point all of this out. Okay, so there are other things that philosophers are good at, complications, you know, I think showing that things are very complicated, often through pointing out the questions that are there and so on. But I want to sort of bring this back to public philosophy and stop talking because I think I'm approaching the limits of my time soon. So what are the implications of what I've said about philosophy for public philosophy? Well, if part of the value of public philosophy is dependent on the, what's valuable in philosophy, then we might think that it's appropriate for public philosophy to do things which acknowledge that value, convey that value to the public. Uh, and so while there's a, a wide range of public philosophy in form and in content, I think that it's a particularly important and uh, pressing task for public philosophy to try to convince the public that answers are not where the value of philosophy is. And to try to, when possible, avoid certain kinds of engagements with the public that put them in the uh, trap of having to defend specific answers. It's very difficult to do. Those, I, I, I've read many columns in the stone, which is the New York Times philosophy. And there's a beautiful piece of philosophy in the stone. And then you have a thousand comments and it's impossible to engage with all of them. And it's probably advisable not to engage with them. But then you get people who take themselves to have successfully refuted an answer uh, that it was offered by the philosopher in this column. And, and that's the end of it. And so if some lay person in the in a random commenter can convince other people that he's successfully toppled the philosopher, then where is the expertise? Where's the philosophical expertise there? Where is the value that the philosopher is bringing here? So I think um, when public philosophy can focus on conveying the value of the questioning, conveying the value of acknowledging our ignorance, convey the value of acknowledging complications, rather than focusing on answers, that would be wonderful. So if we're talking about what the role of philosophers as public intellectuals should be, which I believe is the name of this session, uh, there are gonna be many roles. I'm not gonna say there should be just one, but I do think that an important one is uh, mapping the unknown and conveying the value of that map to the public. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much for the points you made on the answer job. Uh, I think we could indeed uh, see philosophy as a, a principle that basically focuses on questions. And we can move on to Professor Callard. Hi. Um, so I want to um, ask a question, and then I'm going to say something in response to my own question, but I'm not 
I'm sort of more interested in the question than in my response. So I'm also interested in other people's answers to it. So my question is, um, like, who are the philosophers? Um, what does it take to be a philosopher? And I've been asking myself this question a long time. When I was an undergraduate here, at the same institution that I'm at right now, at the University of Chicago, I had a, a very beloved advisor. I wasn't a philosophy major. Um, I was a classics and fundamentals major. I sort of somewhat more literary than philosophical. Um, but I was considering going to grad school in philosophy and I was getting advice from him. And he was like, well, whatever you do, don't start calling yourself a philosopher, right? He's like, that's not, you know, you can say you study philosophy. You can say you work on philosophy. You can say you're interested in reading the work of philosophers like Kant, you know, but don't call yourself. It's, he found it sort of annoying that like the, he was not in the philosophy department, that the people in the philosophy department here, people like me call them, were calling themselves philosopher, right? And now I call myself a philosopher, right? Uh, and it's like, why do I do that, right? Uh, and so I, for a long time, I didn't because of this. Um, uh, and, you know, if you've read Kant, if you've read the Critique of Pure Reason, you know that there at the end, there's a little bit of a surprise ending, which is that Kant tells you that he's not a philosopher. Um, what he says at the very, very end, if you get to this part of the Critique of Pure Reason, is that the philosopher is actually an ideal type. And it would be, I, 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 I've got out my text here to read it to you. Uh, it's something like it would be vainglorious philosopher in the true sense of the word, right? It would be vainglorious to entitle oneself a philosopher and to pretend to have equaled the pattern which exists in the idea alone. Not even Kant is a philosopher, right? Um, uh, and um, so that's like one, one point of view is that the, the philosopher is almost this impossible ideal that none of us can attain to. Um, Another view, like out in the general public, there's this idea that like kind of everyone maybe wants to be able to call themselves a philosopher and like academic philosophers are somehow withholding that from other people who are just as much philosophers as we are. So there's a kind of battle over the term philosopher. Um, another, I find surprising take on this is the end of the Platonic dialogue, the Euthydemus. This is a super weird dialogue that Basically, unless you're a Plato scholar, you're not going to be reading it um, because it is Socrates talking to these two sophists, Euthydemus and Dionysiodorus, who have like the world's worst arguments. Like, I'll give you an example of one of their arguments. It's like, well, if you if you beat your dog and your dog is a father, i.e. the dog has like puppies, right? then you beat your father because he's your dog and he's a father. Right? That's what, They're all like that, right? Now, my own view is these arguments are actually quite a bit better than they're usually taken to be, but, um, but that's the sort of argument that's, that's there. Um, so, so Socrates talking to people who give those kinds of arguments. And at the end um, of, of this conversation, and this is important, the, the end of it is he is, it's, uh, it's in the frame of the dialogue. So those two guys, you, the sophists are not there for this part. This is where he is talking to his friend Crito about the conversation. And he sat, he describes those two guys who give those sorts of arguments as philosophers. To me, that's like, what, right? Socrates, those guys aren't philosophers. They're like the paradigm case of the people about whom we use the not a philosopher operator, right? Those guys are not, philosophers. they're not real philosophers. They're, they're giving these tricky arguments designed to trick people up that are just playing with words or whatever. But Socrates says, eh, don't worry about like, don't worry about the, the practitioners of philosophy. They're not really any good at it. Look at the thing itself. And if you think it's valuable, pursue it. He says this to credit. By the practitioners, practitioners of philosophy, he includes himself. So he's like, I'm like Euthydemus and Dionysodorus. We all suck at philosophy. But if you think philosophy is itself good, then um, maybe you should do it. So this is, maybe this is a, I'll just take a little, um, excursus here. This is one way of responding to Justin's question about philosophy isn't very good at producing settled answers. It just might be that all the people who are doing philosophy suck at it, right? And so that's what Socrates thought. So like the re like philosophy um, as it stands isn't done very well, right? That's an option we should have on the table. We are looking for the answers. We haven't found them because we're not good at it. Okay. Um, so um, um, so my sort of like the question I have is like, what is this weird concept philosopher, right? That there can be this sort of a disagreement about it. Um, 
you know, some people think nobody's a philosopher, even Kant seemed to be drawn to that idea. Some people think you ought to be able to self-identify as a philosopher if you call yourself a philosopher, you're a philosopher. Some people think it's wrong if academic philosophers call themselves philosophers because just having a credential shouldn't mean that you get the title. So there's this battle over the category of philosopher. And I'm not sure why there is this thing and like what, what a philosopher could be such that that battle is an intelligible battle to be had, right? There isn't really a battle like that over a lot of other like career terms. Okay, so here's like one thought. It, 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 this might seem like one of these cases where you ask a question and then you come up with like a theory in response to the question where the theory is so crazy that like, like it couldn't possibly be justified just by trying to answer the question. If that, that's your objection to this, that's reasonable, right? But um, this is the best I can do right now. So um, one way to think about philosophy is that it is the attempt to understand your life um, by kind of like taking into your own hands the concepts, the goals, um, the the sort of like way of dividing up and organizing your life and thought you take that into your own hands right so you're going to sort of like figure it out for yourself so it's a kind of taking your life into your own hands but it's your mind and not your hands um uh thinking through your life for yourself something like that um and um and so there's a lot like you don't have to do that you can sort of to some degree, and we all do this, whether we're philosophers or not, not think about some things and just do them the way that other people do them or the way that it's sort of normal to do them and, and not reflect on them, right? But philosophy is like, no, I'm gonna think about whether that's the way I wanna do it, whether that's the way it should be done, whether that's the way I wanna think about it, whether like that's the way things should be divided up, right? And you might think that that, that kind of thinking that, um, is somehow a basic thing that all human beings should be doing, that it's for everyone in an important sense. Um, in the way that you might like, look, go back a bit in human history and like not everyone was literate, right? Not everyone could read. It's true now that not everyone can read, right? Um, but certainly uh, in the United States, in Greece, right, there's a standard which is that sort of, it's like a, like a basic human right in a sense to be educated to the point of literacy. And we view it as kind of tragic if somebody isn't, right? Um, and, um, but you go back and like, you know, maybe there, there are times in human history when very few, only very elite people were literate, right? Um, and in the times when only those few people were literate, you know, the kind of literary engagement that was possible among human beings was much more limited than what's possible now, now that everyone's, imagine, imagine the internet without literacy, right? <laughs> we couldn't do it because um, so much of it relies on like reading and writing, right? I mean, not this kind, but like most of the internet. Um, so there are sort of new possibilities for literacy that open up once more people are literate, right? And I'll go back further before literacy, go back to speech. So there was like a time when not all human beings could speak, right? I mean, speech had to come into being at some point. We, we can call those people, we can not call those people human beings if you want. But the point is speech didn't always exist. And probably it like got invented or discovered probably in multiple different communities simultaneously, right? We don't know. I mean, this is all prehistory of human beings. We don't know. but you know, there would have just been a time when there was like some speech going on, right? So what I'm saying is that humanity has had these kind of like leveling up moments, right? At least twice, right? From like there being speech that's isolated to basically all human beings speak, right? And literacy is being isolated to being now nearly universal and working towards it. And I wonder whether we shouldn't think the same way about philosophy, that we're just early, this is early days for philosophy. And philosophy is something that human beings have to do together um, uh, in a kind of, um, it has to be sort of like, it ought to be sort of available 
to, for all human beings to freely engage with one another at a philosophical level. And we're not there yet. Um, we're at the stage where like uh, not everyone is literate. Um, and part of the project of public philosophy, uh, I, I think even there it's only, maybe only part, um, is this as a goal, the goal of universal philosophical literacy. So that, that's all I had to say for now. Well, that was exciting. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great point. Thank you. We can continue with Professor Berg and uh, she will respond to Professor Kallard and Professor Weinberg. So. Thank you. Thank you, Janice, for having me. Thank you, everyone, for coming out today. And thank you so much, Agnes and Justin, for your very thought provoking uh, uh, ideas. And I'm going to try to respond to them. And I'm going to respond to them by way of asking you both a question. Um, because there's something that I see that you both have in common in your in what you said, despite some disagreement that uh, Agnes noted, which is that Justin's talking about philosophy as uh, the value of it lies in our ability to ask questions. And if the public philosophy, the good public philosophy would make sure to convey that to the public. And in that I see also, um, I think somewhere else you called it, uh, trying to free us from the, is it the answer trap, right? So maybe also in our lives, we will, we will understand the value of being in a place of questioning and inquiry. And that seems to me incredibly valuable. And I really like what you talked, you said, the philosophy helps us to map the unknown. I think in these times where people are so full of certainty, uh, it's very good to have a practice that helps us question that and, 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 and making it clear to us what are the things that we don't know and where we, where we think we have settled opinions, but we don't. And I see something very common between that and what Agnes had, had said to us, which is she suggested that perhaps um, she painted this ideal where we're very, very far away from it. Right now, philosophy is something that only a few people do, but, in the, but uh, maybe in the future or in some right, this sort of ideal that we're going to be at least living uh, uh, with reference to, um, it's, it's a life for everyone of figuring out stuff for themselves, because philosophy and self is an activity that helps us figure out how to live, lead our lives for ourselves. And, and I have a big question uh, about this, and I'm going to ask it by way of uh, a short analogy. Uh, maybe it'll turn out to be more than an analogy. But so here are two ideas of freedom. Uh, or sort of a, what would be a best way for a human to be in the world. Um, and well, maybe there are more, but here are two. So one of them is, uh, will, take, will be one in which we're most free when we get to stop and uh, maybe step back from uh, conventions and our inclinations and what we are, or what we've done before and habit. And we can stop and we can reflect on what on that and we can really decide for ourselves. So we can stop and we can we can question and we um, um, and that's the moment we think of the, the paragon of a free life. And that's a very attractive view because it's very easy to understand, it seems, why we assign responsibility on, under that view, because you know, everyone is deciding everything for themselves. So so we know why we're holding you uh, responsible for everything you've done. You did it for yourself. And another ideal, um, and if the first one uh, perhaps is Kantian or some a lot of interpretations of Kant sort of lead us to the first ideal. The second one perhaps is Aristotelian. The second ideal says that, that this, is, um, this is far from an ideal situation, having to step back and think and, and reflect. But really, if we're thinking about an ideal society, the place where we're aiming at, we're talking about a place where we are justifiably not required to step back from norms. And we are justifiably not required to, um, to doubt our inclinations, but we can trust them. Right, because in the best case, our inclinations and what we know to be the best thing to do, they really coincide. And, and under that kind of conception, the idea of having to sometimes stop and step back and reflect and question our inclination, question the societal norm, um, perhaps they're necessary. And of course, no one would argue that they're not necessary today in a society where both we do not have good reason to trust all our inclinations. We don't have good reason to trust all our norms. But these are exceptional stage and st states, and they're not that we don't want to define the ideal by them. Um, ideally, we would be able to just be in the world. 
Um, and we would be raised in a way that would perfectly uh, kind of equip us to handle whatever life throws at us. And the fact that we have to, uh, we have to stop and we have to reflect and we have to decide things for myself, that's an indication of either something radically new happening um, or in fact of something of, 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 of even a greater malfunction. So the norms and, and the way I was brought up and the habits I have do not prepare me well for the situation I'm facing. And, and I find something, uh, I find wanting to ask by analogy, um, how, how this ideal of public philosophy um, as sort of an ideal that we're seeking where everyone is having to kind of figure out life for themselves, as Agnes said, or where we're sort of, um, we're thinking that the most valuable philosophical activity is somehow asking these questions. Um, and, and I just wonder, you know, to, how, do we, how do we answer that given the sort of, um, the story about freedom that I just painted, where, uh, you know, I think there's something incredibly attractive about thinking that we do not want to have, uh, uh, or the way I painted it, saying there's something there's something that's gone missing, there's something that's gone wrong when we have to take on that responsibility for ourselves every given time, every decision, and and do it ourselves. So that's sort of a question for both Agnes and Justin, um, and I'd be very curious to hear what they have to say. Uh, so, Professor Carl. Would you like to answer first? Sure. So um, the first thing is like, I actually don't think you can do it by yourself. Um, and that's part of why I think you want other people to be doing it. So you have as many helpers mm -hmm. as possible. Um, but I take your basic point and I think it's true at a bunch of different levels. So one level is, I, so here's a point in which I disagree with Justin. Like, I think the point of philosophy is to find answers. Um, so I think we want those answers. The reason we're doing it is to have the answers and, uh, it'd be great if we could stop and just have the answers. Cause that would be to have knowledge and that's the goal. Um, so, but there's a big danger of thinking that you have the answer before you have it. Um, so I think that, and the society I was describing wasn't necessarily the one with the answers. It was more like the one that has a chance of coming up with the answers. Um, so it wasn't the end point. Um, and so if you want to say, well, then there's an end point. Uh, and those people have the answers. Yes, I think, um, but I think that in the, if they have the answers, they can teach them to one another. Um, and so that that's what it would be. There would be a, in place of a certain kind of inquiry, there would be a certain kind of teaching. This is the kind of thing Socrates is always asking people to do to him. Like, oh, if you know what piety is, could you just teach it to me? Um, I suspect that the, in order to be taught in such a way that you would know that teaching would have, it would still involve a kind of inquisitive character um, so that you really know it. Um, but I think that even like, even setting aside that, you know, ideal state, which like Socrates thinks is not going to be within our lifetimes, like maybe not even in an embodied condition. There's a, I think there's a point before there, there's something, um, so there's, there's, there's something like um, agreement, I think that's possible. Um, agreement to answers that you don't know are the right answers, but that have not been refuted yet. So at the end of the Gorgias, there's this list of things that we find we can't negate. It's not the law of non-contradiction. It's not on that list, though Aristotle thinks it's on that list. Um, but it's things like um, doing um, uh, injustice is worse than suffering injustice. Um, nobody voluntarily does wrong. Um, if you have injustice in your soul, it's good to be punished, etc. And Socrates sees the, these as things that conclusions in effect that he has come to, he doesn't claim to know them, but he thinks it's important to stick to them because he's agreed to them with other people right? And we're like, we're not going to let this go unless, unless it's refuted. And my thought is that sort of that's what philosophical progress looks like, is that we come to agree to certain things because we find it's hard to refute them. And we make sure we stick to those things unless somebody does refute it. But I think it's very difficult to create the proper context for those agreements um, when philosophy is like, um, restricted in the ways that it's restricted now. So my hope would be that in a world where philosophy was more universal, those um, 
that process of agreeing to things until we find that um, they're refuted and holding on to them and telling other people what those are and inviting them to refute them. Um, that like that process could get a better grip. So that's my that's my thought. Great, thanks, Agnes. Okay, well, thanks very much for that really rich question, Anastasia. Um, very, very provocative and super interesting. Um, I mean, it, it raises lots of lots of different kinds of thoughts. Um, so, uh, the two pictures you give um, of you know, this one version of freedom, where you're taking responsibility for yourself and thinking through things, abandoning habit and convention, uh, versus this other one, where look, you're, you're this is the ideal society. You've been appropriately taught and acculturated into the, the proper, correct answers and beliefs, uh, and so. Um, there's no need to step back from from your natural tendencies uh, and thoughts at all. Um, I d definitely feel the pull of both of these. So it was inter it, it's it's kind of interesting for me to think about. Well, what would this mean for other kinds of of disciplines, right? Well, which ones should we aim for? So this ideal society, which we we, we sort of don't have to do philosophy anymore, right? Uh, what about a society in which, okay. Uh, They've made, they figured out all that all that there is to know about bugs, insects, right? Entomology completely completed, right? Entomology is done, and in so we imagine a society in which like there's just nothing more to learn about bugs and insects. Great, all right. I feel like society has not lost anything when we know everything there is to know about bugs, and no one has to investigate bugs anymore. Right? Then I think about uh, music. All right, here's a site in which there's all the music, beautiful music's been made. We've figured out every permutation of every combination of notes, sounds, tones, timbres, paces, tempos, time signatures, right? It's all there, you just, you know, just press a button, you know? And, and it's there, you don't have to make any music anymore. It's just, it's there. And when I think about that, well, I think, well, that's less good. I mean, in some ways, instrumentally valuable, right? In lots of ways, but a world that, makes it unnecessary for you to create your own beauty, right? I think is a world that's bad in a, in a certain way, right? Okay, so where does philosophy fit in here, right? Is philosophy more like entomology? Is philosophy more like music making? Um, well, if philosophy is this, you know, this picture we get from Chalmers, uh, you know, this very, or, or, you know, I think what a very popular view of philosophy, this science uh, adjacent uh, enterprise where we're, we're, we're we're seeking answers, then um, maybe it's more like uh, entomology. And because the questions are, seem to be more important to us than the status of bugs, we mistakenly attribute value to the process rather than to the knowledge that would be at, at the end. By the way, just as a side to Agnes, right? So Agnes says she disagrees with me about the answers thing. Um, I, I, it's not that answers themselves aren't valuable, Right. I, I didn't want to, I don't want to, if I, so if I said that, um, I, I think the answers can be valuable. I think that the value of philosophy might not be in its capacity to answer philosophical questions. The value of philosophy regarding questions might be it produces these questions and then um, many other disciplines play a role in the answering of these kinds of things. And we see this kind of uh, attrition of philosophical inquiry over time. We also see a growth of philosophical inquiry in the propagation of questions, but we also see some attrition in that, okay, now this is psychology, and now this is economics, and now this is chemistry, and, and so on, to, to some extent, too. Um, okay, so to, just to go, so to go back to this choice, right, that, that Anastasia gives us, um, I'm not, I'm not sure, it, it seems like that second society puts philosophy as this, this sort of simply instrumental inquiry towards these answers, and I feel that that doesn't do justice to the value of it. Uh, I'm not sure I have a good, I'm not sure I have a good argument uh, at the moment for that. Sometimes when I think about the distant future of, of philosophy, and I wonder, uh, you know, after we, we've had many more, much more inductive evidence. I think we already have a ton of inductive evidence about philosophy's capacity for answering questions, but I, I do have to admit, you know, it's possible, as Agnes puts it, that this is a very young discipline and, and you know, Derek Parfit famously says at the end of Reasons and Persons when he raises all these problems and has trouble answering them that uh, 
ethics is a pretty young enterprise, he says. So, um, so, so maybe, yeah, maybe in um, 10,000 years, maybe in 100,000 years, if we're still around doing philosophy, we'll, we'll be better at it. Uh, but one thing to think about is, okay, well, suppose we get to that point in the future when we've answered all of these questions and, uh, and we don't have to do philosophy anymore. Um, with, is that a desirable endpoint? Right? Are we gonna run out of questions? Are we even gonna get to that endpoint? Um, I think it's just very provocative to think about. I don't think I have a more conclusive answer to say here than that. So I'll leave it at that for now and see uh, what you all have to say. Can I add a quick thing? Yeah. Uh, just um, like, I think there's something, maybe there's a, there's a distinction one might make. The same teacher of mine is an undergraduate who told me not to call myself a philosopher. He made this great distinction that I've carried with me uh, between a question and a problem. And I think that like some intellectual, you know, um, uh, pursuits are problem solving. And I think Justin's right that it's important not to see philosophy that way. The etymology is really helpful here. The problema is a, uh, um, it's a Greek word from a wall that was thrown up for a, an opposing enemy. So like if you were retreating and you didn't want the enemy to follow you, you would throw up a, put up a wall and then they, it would be harder for them to follow you. I don't understand how this could possibly be efficient, but um, uh, so, um, so it's literally like, that's a problem is like a wall that they have to overcome to like get to you and kill you, right? And so a problem is something that you're trying to get rid of. Um, a question, uh, it comes from choir to seek or to hunt, right? Like a quest. And there's something you're after. And it's like, imagine you're hunting a rabbit or something, I don't know. You're like, that's your target, that's your goal. And you kind of love that thing and you're after it, right? And when you have it, you have what you wanted. And it's not that there's some other thing that you wanted, like getting the enemy, right? Um, so it is important, I think, in saying that we want the answers. It's not because we want the answers for something else or something. It's it's a quest. It's not like problem solving, I would say. So like even if we want the answers, it's important to not hear that answer in the in the problem mode. I think that's the thing I want to add. Uh, would Professor Berg want to add something to that? Well, there, there's questions. so much. I guess. I guess uh -huh. one thing that I did. Um, I think one thing that I did want to say. Um, I did. Well, I wanted to keep my remarks short because I want to make sure that we have some time for questions. But I think um, maybe just to add to something that Agnes now said about how we can think of a question um, uh, as having built into its own logic a desire for the answer um, in a way that is not. It's not a means to another end. We can't understand what a question is unless we're thinking of it as leading to an answer. And then in particular, in the case of philosophy, I was just thinking while Justin was talking about, um, and, and I'll leave it also as sort of a dilemma, that there really are, you know, there's, there's, on the one hand, I want to say something like, but Justin, imagine being wise about, you know, you're, you're one with the one, you're thinking thought. Do you really think you're, you're, you're in that state, you're going, oh, I, I wish I was, I was lost and confused about what is knowledge and what is and what should I do? And, and that's hard for me to imagine. I mean, that state of completeness seems like what we are aiming for. And on the other hand, um, and there's also a sort of a long history of, of articulating this thought. Uh, I'll give I'll give one instance of it. And you know, if you look at if you look at in Dante, you know, the higher you go in heaven, the more everything seems a bit dull and boring and the same. And the you know, the further you go in hell, everything seems very interesting and um, um, and sort of exciting. Um, and I think uh, sort of so there's something about there's something terrifying about that state of but no no new music and no more questions and no more 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 striving um, because we're just you know, we're done and we're, we're, so I think I'll leave it at sort of articulating this dilemma between the two. Um, uh, and so to acknowledge that I both, I both think that Agnes is right, but I see why Justin is, is worried about that state. And maybe it sort of indicates how far we are from it, that, you know, what we feel is sort of, is sort of repellent and unattractive. Um, and that's all I have to say for today. Certainly how far I am from it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I want to thank, thank the three of you. Thank you very much for your insights into this. Um, I think we can move to the questions and you can raise your hands. We already have some, a comment from Jenny uh, on the chat. It's uh, for Professor Weinberg. She says, it's not that it is bad world, but an impossible world. Change keeps producing philosophy. Major movements keep 
uh, keeps producing philosophy. That's one of the reasons why so many great thinkers today operate from or in places of unrest and change. Um, the Arab world, Iran, uh, South America, etc. I'm not sure what's the reference for that. Um, I think she was referring to a world that in, in which we do have the answers. Uh, so okay. that, that second world that Anastasia has sketched for us. Um, and you know, just to say something quickly, I mean, there is this inter interesting uh, question in philosophy about whether there are in fact new, real new philosophical questions. Uh, and if there are, uh, how do they come about? I, I happen to think that we, we, there are new philosophical questions, or at least we, I mean, I'm not gonna take a position on whether we create or discover them, but we are at the very least uh, becoming aware of, of new philosophical questions. And that's actually one of the ways in which philosophy makes progress is by showing that, uh, well, there, there's one question and its answer actually depends on these 10 other questions that no one was asking until these philosophers came around and said, oh, we have to, to look at these questions and so we can have a, a more detailed view. It could be the case that as the question suggests um, that events in the real world and not just philosophical, further philosophical inquiry generates new philosophical questions. And I think that would be uh, interesting to think about. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Professor of Philosophy Stelios Pripodakis at uh, the University of Athens, and then we can move to the chat. Well, thank you so much for this discussion, your talks and discussion. I mean, all this is very enlightening, and I'm interested in metaphilosophical issues, and I see that all of you really dwell on these metaphilosophical questions. Now, I just have two minor points which may help mediate or clarify some points and perhaps mediate between Agnes and Justin regarding uh, answers, wanting the answers or giving or just not wanting the answers, not expecting the answers. What about just saying that philosophy really helps you map the possible answers? I mean, uh, David Lewis, used to say that philosophy gives you the menu of possible solutions if you want to use the problem terminology or the menu of possible answers. And it's mapping the unknown to the extent that you don't expect to get to know which one of them is the correct one. Maybe God knows or from the point of view of eternity, you know, somebody sees which one is the right one. But just doing this, this description or menu of possible answers would be quite interesting and worth pursuing. And now another way of, 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 of dealing with this issue of the peculiarity of philosophical questions would be to invoke a distinction made by Martin Hollis, if I'm not mistaken, in a, a, an introduction to philosophy entitled Invitation to Philosophy, if, if I'm not mistaken, where he draws this distinction between closed and open questions. Now, not open in the sense that they have not been answered yet, but open in the sense that everything is up for grabs. You don't really know, understand the concepts, you don't even understand what you're asking and you want to clarify that. So. Whenever we, we, we ask a philosophical question, and it is a philosophical question, it's open in that sense. Now, some philosophical questions are closed in this sense, and then they are taken up by science, and they are open in another sense because science knows how to go about answering them. But in philosophy, sometimes we don't know how to go about answering them. And one final question I would like to ask you I mean, I understand that all of you come from the analytic tradition, and I would like you to, to, to uh, comment on whether you think that uh, there is good public philosophy to be done in a different style or following different methods from the continental side. If, if you think that the divide still exists or makes sense to some extent. I know public philosophy or philosophy uh, uh, as uh, philosophers, as public intellectuals, is a big issue in France. I mean, France has a big tradition of philosophy as 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 a public kind of domain of uh, discussion with a political uh, kind of uh, impact, or at least 
they hope that this has a political impact in education and other matters. And something you didn't touch upon, by the way, I thought you were going to do that, was political issues and practical issues, uh, which we are, uh, you know, now nowadays with the pandemic, we are all uh, concerned with. I mean, do you think that philosophy, philosophers, public intellectuals can make some kind of contribution to dealing with these issues, at least at the conceptual level? Or, well, I'm, I don't know if I have spoken too, too, too long, I mean, but uh, thank you, thank you again. Thank you very much, Professor Rukidakis. Would someone uh, like to answer first? Justin, yeah. I, I, I don't want to uh, hog the time, so, but I'll, so I'll be very, very brief. Um, uh, on, on the very last point about philosophers contributions to dealing with various political and practical issues, uh, that is a version I think of, of public philosophy and that has been done. Uh, I think it was in uh, Sweden, for example, where there was a panel of, uh, regarding various measures to take in regards to COVID. And I, I think there was a, a team of philosophers that were involved with the government and working on that. And that's just one example of many where philosophers can come in and help you know, with that traditional job of clearing up muddy thinking or drawing out the implications or pointing out missed um, considerations that are worth paying attention to. So I think there's that. Uh, as to this other question towards the end about whether uh, there is value to be had in public philosophy outside an analytic tradition, uh, absolutely. Um, I think would be the, the answer. It's, it's true. Uh, uh, the analytic tradition is in a way my tradition. I, I do think that distinction is becoming much less important uh, over time, uh, but as a general sort of taking the long view perspective, uh, you know, analytic philosophy has only been around for a little while and it would be very strange to think that uh, we are I don't know, fortunate enough to have lived and become philosophers during the very time where we figured out the exact best way to do philosophy. Um, I feel like that, that's a little bit too lucky uh, to, uh, to think that that's the case. So I, I certainly think there's Analytic philosophy has no monopoly whatsoever on, uh, on conveying the value of philosophy or doing valuable philosophical things. Um, and regarding, I, I think I'll leave it there um, um, and say I appreciate the question and hand it over to uh, Agnes and Anastasia. Um, okay, so you asked kind of a lot of questions. Um, I'll say a few things. I mean, one. I guess one thing I want to say, which is not a direct response to anything you said, but it's sort of just me still pondering over Justin's comments, is that like something that I think Justin's really right about is that these answers, like there's a way in which we all always think we have all of these answers and that is the problem. And it is the job of philosophers to get us not to close the question prematurely and that is so much the job of philosophers that sort of in some way, like what, how I would put it, maybe unfairly just exaggerating that by saying, we're just trying to ask the questions. There's a way in which that conveys a really important truth um, because what other people are doing is just taking themselves, and we are all doing insofar as we're not doing philosophy, it's just taking ourselves to have answers like all the time. So, um, but to the, to the questions about um, continental philosophy, I don't know, like I kind of hope that distinction doesn't go away. I like the idea that there are different styles of philosophy and they don't know how to talk to each other. You know, that's sort of like, um, it's like, it suggests, I mean, in some ways it's bad, but in some ways it suggests really robust philosophical communities that develop like norms and modes of communicating that uh, it's like a, like a world. Um, and maybe until everybody does, philosophy, there need to be these sort of worlds inside the world. Um, and, um, you know, is one of them best? Maybe one of them is best, um, but it would be hard to know that from the point of view of only one of them, right? Maybe whichever one is the best is the one that's going to win out when everyone does philosophy, but who knows which one that is. Um, uh, but I don't know. I mean, my sense is, I, you know, uh, I was in a German, a German newspaper, like it was like the, it was like, I think it was Die Zeit or something. It was like a major German newspaper that they did a profile on me and Lori Paul. Like it would never be in an American newspaper. Uh, and I read something in the in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung uh, at like a, a couple of days ago from this philosopher, um, Rahel Yegi, I think is her name. And she's talking about the pandemic and like 
you know, kind of so, like socialism, the idea of socialism and response depending, but there's so, there seems to be a level of philosophical engagement there that's maybe in a way greater than what we have here, um, but it didn't seem particularly continental in any way. It wasn't something I couldn't easily engage with. Uh, so I don't know whether those, that divide really still exists to what degree it does. Um, uh, and can we help with the pandemic and with these sort of questions? I guess I think we can help with all sorts of different questions. Um, and the question is just, it's like there's a constant tension between in some ways wanting to speak in a way that addresses the things that people are concerned with and making sure you don't set your sights too low as a philosopher. You know, like if your site, like that's why I gave this idea of the universal, the time of universal philosophy, like in some way, my one of my big concerns as a public philosopher is like whatever the goals of public philosophy are, they better be like really big. They better be big enough to be meriting the title of philosophy. And so like getting through the pandemic is not big enough, you know? So it's like, you wanna say something there, but like, you don't want that to be, you also wanna be like, yeah, but there are bigger things we're worried about, so. Uh, would you like to add something, uh, Professor Berg? Yes, please, I was just have to unmute myself. I wanted to say two quick things by way of, I think, concluding. No, sorry, we have some more time. We start at 6.30. Is that right? We have time for more questions. Okay, then a little bit more relaxed in my answer. So I have one thing I wanted to say about two questions, perhaps at once. And so the first question that you asked, and I think Justin and Agnes, I don't know if you guys said anything about this, but it was the idea of maybe we can settle this um, dispute about philosophy as uh, oriented towards an answer or philosophy oriented towards a question if we focus on this idea of philosophy as mapping out possibilities. And this uh, reminded me sort of a very concrete thing that I come uh, against as somebody who does in addition to working on contemporary questions in philosophy, I also do the history of philosophy. And a lot of times I have to answer either colleagues or students, so what do we do when we do the history of philosophy? And the reason why it's related is because sometimes uh, the answers we give uh, has something of that flavor is that the history of philosophy allows that us to see those those possibilities right we've had so many years of people thinking about these questions and coming up with new ones so we might you know if we look at a history of philosophy isn't that that would be very valuable towards getting all those possibilities and I like to call it the buffet the history of philosophy is the buffet of philosophy and we go to the buffet and that's what the, the value and perhaps it's it's not not valuable um, to have a lot of options on the table but I think that we we shortchange philosophy or the, if we think of it that way, and I think we shortchange the history of philosophy if we think of it that way. And that's because I think that the best way to think of the history of philosophy at least is to think of it as a dialogue that we have. And we don't, we don't just have it because that's where we're gonna find all the answers. It's because in so philosophy does have that nebulous and very hard to trace effect on how we actually live our lives and how we think then being able to trace that history and be in conversation with those that came before us, with the ideas that have, you know, seeped into the ways we think, all of us think of how we live our lives um, and have been, but also have been corrupted and have been changed. And that we have to engage in that, in that sort of process of trying to understand the thinkers from our own point of view in order to understand ourselves. I think Heidegger said things to this effect. So, and I think that's very important. So I just actually want to resist the idea of thinking of history, sorry, philosophy or the history of philosophy as this, this just a map of possibilities, but rather really thinking about it through the idea of dialogue. Now, dialogue is very important. It's very hard to have a dialogue if you, are, you know, if you only have one idea in mind. And so from that perspective, it is really important that we both um, we're thinking about our predecessors, we're thinking of our colleagues, we're thinking of other people with whom we can ask the questions. I think maybe that's going along, I hope, something that Agnes was saying. Um, but I don't want to think about it again in this very instrumental way as if we just sort of consult it because then we have all the options and we'll switch one of them in and out. And the second thing I want to say, and it's about the analytic and continental divide, I liked what Agnes said about uh, that it's cool that there's a difference. And I think that on the level of the philosophical activity before we think about public philosophy, um, I see her point. But I also think that there is something quite remarkable that does happen when we try and when a philosopher tries to say anything to the public is that the measure or the 
the language, the methods, the, the, the terms that they have to use cannot be of their own philosophical tradition. They have to be of the public. You know, if I apply my, my quirky method and no one can understand me, no one can follow me, then what have I done? And so, and this is, I wouldn't have mentioned it unless it was in this context. I saw something that Agamben, right? Who writes in a very different philosophical tradition, but he wrote it for a public. He wrote it in a public um, uh, space and he wrote about the pandemic and I had thoughts about it. So I wrote back and I felt that here, you know, I don't know if we could have a conversation. I don't know if there's a conference of, of philosophers only that we would, uh, that everybody would understand both of us. Um, but I think in that it, there's something so special when you try and talk to the public, you have to speak their language. And so I, you know, I, I think that anybody in Europe can read Agnes's um, uh, sort of fantastic columns because I don't think she's, she's, she comes from an analytic tradition. It obviously informs the way she thinks, but I think, I think uh, that the measure of what she, she's doing is the public itself. So I think that's, um, that's something to say, but and as my last comment, I do want to say, and I see also in the chat, a lot of people are asking about it. So, and this is sort of a, a pessimistic note about what I think that philosophy could give to the public and how can it help it think through questions of the day. And this is a place where I want to, uh, I've often been sort of publicly cautious and I've been trying to, 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 to warn about all these ways and we can sort of corrupt both philosophy and sort of our respect for the public when we do public philosophy. And uh, I'll say something that I haven't said publicly before, which is that one of my favorite, favorite, favorite pieces of public philosophy is Wittgenstein's lecture on ethics. And in his, uh, in his lecture, he says, you know, the worst thing that I could do in giving you this lecture, the only public lecture he's given in his life would be to make you believe that you understood something you haven't. And I think we should all sort of remember that, you know, the, the philosophical insight as attractive as it may be, um, it's something that we can easily create semblances of, um, and we can sort of take them and take them home and feel very good about ourselves. And that's, I think, something we should always be uh, very careful about. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, another five questions, uh, I think. So Vasilis has uh, asked to... Vasily, are you here? Yes, yes. Oh, thank you. Hi. <clears throat> thank you very much. This is a, a great discussion. Now, I have a question <clears throat> about the role of controversy in public philosophy. Uh, let me explain my question by paraphrasing Kant. Now, let's say um, experiences without concepts are blind. Concepts without experiences are empty. Now, in the times that we live, we are bombarded with all kinds of experiences, crisis, everything. And the question of the time is, do we possess the concepts adequate to cope with all, with all that? Now, this is a central question. And it seems to me that if one wants to, to deal philosophically at the philosophical level with that question, one has a sort of to, to, to grab the nestle from where it stinks most. So the question is this, how do you deal at the philosophical level with highly controversial public questions, public issues? Maybe I'll say something quick about that. Um, in a, an hour, I'm doing an event on transgender. <laughs> There's a... Um, highly controversial public issue. Um, I don't totally know how I'm gonna deal with it. So like, it, you know, if you wanna find out, tune in, um, I put it in the chat. Um, but in general, the way that I tend to deal with it is by figuring out which part of it I have the best questions about and finding the people to whom I can ask those questions. So I would say I approach controversial issues inquisitively with a view to seeing what is there that I can learn in this territory. Um, maybe I can do, I can follow up and say some two quick things about um, controversy. So I think one thing that philosophers can do is, and I should say the way I hear the question is also when we have controversy, um, a lot of times the, the 
parties are pretty settled in where they are, right? They're not, they're not necessarily approaching it like two philosophers trying to think about what they should think about a topic. People, the controversies of the day are things that people come into um, with strong opinions. Uh, what Agnes is gonna do soon is a very good example of that. And so I think there, there are two things to think about here. The first thing is I think a philosopher can, and by the way, the history of philosophy is very useful in this regard. Um, it can show us sort of maybe sort of underlying assumptions um, the history of our debates, the, the kind of ways in which this question is not new. A lot of times, one of the problem, one of the ways of controversies of the day, they have a shape of sort of believing they're completely new without realizing that sort of many, many times this question has been asked before. And so I think that's a very useful thing that philosophers can do. But the other thing, and that's something that sometimes I get asked, um, especially about philosophers on social media. So that's one form of public philosophy. And, 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 and there, when people talk about how to participate in controversies, what they mean is sort of, how do you do it? I mean, what's the point? You know, when, you, when, when people are so, um, they're so locked in, I mean, it's sort of, it would be sort of naive to think that you can actually change somebody's mind as a philosopher. In that case, often think of what we do is, I, I don't necessarily try and convince the person I'm arguing with, or not convince the person I'm having this disagreement with, but really, and this I think is maybe a role for public philosophers, is model something, model of way of, you know, talking, of treating other people uh, in good faith, of um, helping other people think conceptually through, through uh, the things they're disagreeing about. So I think a lot about this idea of modeling um, as opposed to persuasion or, um, or trying to convince anyone as a public philosopher. So uh, I think this is really uh, an important question because we do face a lot of controversial topics. Uh, to add to uh, the really good answers uh, from my co-panelists, I, I would just say um, wisdom, you know, philosophy is sort of this pursuit of wisdom where we want to be thoughtful persons and uh, we can talk about the thoughtfulness or wisdom we have regarding a subject. Uh, but we can also talk about the thoughtfulness and wisdom we have regarding our modes of inquiry into that subject, right? We can be thoughtful about that too. So I think one of the ways in which philosophers can contribute to the discussion of uh, controversial matters in public is to, in a way, investigate the, the ways in which these controversies are manifesting themselves, the ways people are talking about them, uh, whether we're taking into account appropriate effects and interests and so on, and to try to um, approach things in a way that's thoughtful about uh, the conversation itself. That's one thing. And I think another thing, which is a bit more connected to my initial remarks, uh, it, and uh, is that I agree that, you know, as um, Anastasia put it, people are coming to these topics fairly uh, energetically, you know, and, and in some ways uh, very much attached to their own particular view, uh, sometimes for uh, reasons that would be laid out in a very straightforward justification, other times for reasons of uh, political or social affiliation. And um, I do think that when one of the things that philosophers are particularly good at are raising questions, raising complications um, and being very careful uh, and in a way that can be con that can contribute to intellectual humility. Uh, and I think that I mentioned in passing in my remarks earlier, this practical value of all these questionings that can be the encouragement of intellectual humility. And I feel like if people are able to, to recognize that there are a lot of deep unsettled questions below the controversy, maybe that can turn the controversy down a little bit and make conversation a little bit more uh, productive of something of value. Um, and then just the, the last thing I'll add is, uh, I think it's, it's always good to take a long view. Uh, as Agnes did when she was talking about the possibility of the future and, and Anastasia too, uh, in which we know the answers. Um, I, I, I think when we think about controversial answers, we think about, well, if this discussion was happening a thousand years from now or 5,000 years from now or 10,000 years from now, how would it be different? What kinds of possibilities might be on the table? How much does that tell us about how little we know? And I feel like taking that long view can also contribute, can contribute to intellectual humility in a valuable way. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, that almost answers that uh, the question that Brian poses. It's just as in, just in theory that philosophy should point out questions lead to whataboutism. 
there are always more questions and thus identifying more questions than just prevent, for example, justice. Um, I'm not sure if you have something to add. Would you like to, to add something to that? I think that's, that's so that I think if I understand the correct, uh, question correctly, um, sometimes we want our questioning to lead to action. And it seems that in order for questioning to lead to action, in between the question and the action has to be an answer that we know is true. And that way we can act on that. And so I guess I would just put a question mark on that assumption there, right? We can have the questioning, we can have the action. It's not clear that we need a true answer to the questions or confidence in, in, in the necessary a true answer to the questions that we're completely certain about you know, uh, in order to act. We might think, uh, given that we have to make a choice between action and inaction, given that uh, each of these choices will have consequences on people's interests or others things that have interests, uh, we might need to, there might be a kind of urgency to our decision that can't wait for uh, the kind of certainty we might hope for. Uh, sometimes just that's the way way life is. So I, uh, I agree that there's an interesting question there, but I, I don't think we need certainty in the answers prior to action or justified action. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Costantinos on this. Actually, Anastasia, you want to say something about this though? I guess, thanks, Justin. Um, I guess it's, I want to put a, a question mark about another maybe deeper assumption of the of the former question. And I think it's a, another important uh, note of, of not pessimism, but I think an important one, which is that I think it's very easy to overestimate um, how persuasive or how influential philosophers are vis-a-vis -vis what people think and what people do. Um, I think philosophy is very important. And I think certain versions of public philosophy are valuable but I think it's if if we want to put that value in terms of Dustin you already said this you know um they had not promoted world peace they have not promoted so far some agreement on knowledge and so I think I'll be very careful even and just thinking uh you know it matters that you know if philosophers continue asking questions I don't think it'll be a hindrance to justice because I don't think you know justice is going to be um promoted simply by any action that philosophers uh, take privately or publicly. Uh, would Professor Collard want to add something to that? No, that's fine. We can go to the next question. <laughs> Thank you. From Kostadinos uh, Gordis, would you agree that Deleuze's and Qatar's claim that philosophy is the creation of concepts in response to a particular kind of problems? Is the creation of concepts a key com component of philosophy that separates it from other fields? Would someone want to start? I'm sure I'll say something about that. Um, I think I don't know if <laughs> that's something I shouldn't have jumped in, but I think that philosophy does sort of re like it it is one of the ways in which we reorganize the conceptual territory. I'm not sure philosophy is the only uh, field that does that. Um, and, um, you know, this is related to the person who asked about Kant and like the experience without concepts are blind. I think like there, um, I, I think that something that can happen is that a field of experience somehow comes into view and then it needs to be conceptualized. And, um, uh, and I, I do think philosophers are among the people who can do that, um, but I, I, don't, I don't think that that's somehow the main or the only function of philosophy. And if I can add to that, I think, um... This is, this is something a teacher of mine once noted to me, and I thought it was, it's been helpful over the years. This is true that philosophy at, at, at very important moments can be creative and sort of comes up with um, new concepts or it appropriates a concept that has been used in one way and suddenly it gives it a new meaning because it thinks that the vocabulary that we have isn't somehow sufficient to describe something important. So we have, you know, Aristotle and Ergea and Heidegger and Dasein or maybe Kate Mann and Hympathy. And, um, and so we have sort of an emergence of a new uh, of a new concept, but I here's something I think that uh, I don't know if this is necessary the convention of new concepts, but something that is it seems uh, important to understand about philosophy and that distinguishes it from the special science sciences is that every the, the special sciences have distinct concepts 
of their own. Um, and that they all, and, you know, to engage in them, we fundamentally have to know them and know their meaning and, and, and the sort of a language that you have to have in order to enter that special discourse as a special sign. And a philosophy, first of all, before it invents perhaps new, new concepts, it deals with those concepts, if, if that's what they are, that are common to all of us. Um, so being, we all, we all say that things are all the time. This is, and that is, and that isn't. What is it that we mean? It's a philosopher who asks, what is it that we mean when we say something is? Um, uh, to act, and how should I act? That's something that we all, all of us, all the time have to ask. A claim to knowledge um, is something that all of us, philosophers or not, are, are, we're using these words. We're using the words belief. We're using the words want. We're using the words um, you should and shouldn't do that. Um, and that that is something that distinguishes philosophy and also gives rise in a way to the questions that we've been dealing with for the whole panel, which is um, this idea that perhaps then everyone should be able to do philosophy or what Agnes was talking about before when she said, you know, there's this claim by so many people who think maybe everyone should be able to do this. Maybe everyone is a philosopher. And I think it's precisely the fact that at heart, first of all, um, it's that it's those common concepts that we constantly use that the philosopher, first of all, sort of stops and says, well, you know, what do we even mean when we're using these, these concepts that we, we all, uh, without exception, share? Uh, would Professor uh, Weinberg want to add something? I think I'd just only note that it seems to me that, as Anastasia mentioned, uh, the sciences um, are very good at creating concepts uh, in various and social sciences as well. It's, it was, I, I, sometimes we need to be on guard about philosophy arrogating to itself things that <laughs> all sorts of inquirers and in various interests do. Uh, we don't have a monopoly on concept creation. We don't have a monopoly on critical thinking, right? Uh, so we should, we should take it easy. We're good at certain things, but that doesn't mean we're the only ones who do it. Uh, we have a question from Aletra Repeto, but she has uh, left and she said that it was answered by, by you before. So uh, we move on to Madhu. There's a message from him. Hello all, I'm a little bit of an outsider in this group. I'm neither a philosophy student nor professor, rather a physics uh, postdoc, part of the public part of public philosophy. I feel one point has been missed. Philosophy seems to have a therapeutic value. As a physicist, the philosophy of physics, realist or unrealist, can play a valuable role in helping me live my academic life in a way that is somewhat sane. For, some, for example, on positing questions in physics, in an epistemological manner, which usually amounts to phenomenological manner in terms of experiments, helps me think in a manner that keeps me grounded and also somewhat irrelevant uh, to the experiments being performed. So thank you, Madhu. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that was a question, so would someone want to comment on that? I'll say something about it. If um, and maybe Madhu can follow up if um, it, so there is a tradition of thinking of philosophy as having some kind of therapeutic value. It's often, um, it's not something I understand very well. So don't, don't take my word on what the, you know, but the thought seems to be that somehow philosophy is supposed to get you out of the tangles. There are certain kinds of philosophy that get you out of the tangles that are themselves distinctively philosophical tangles. Um, but I don't think that, that doesn't sound like what you're talking about there. Um, it sounds like you can kind of have a frame for what you're doing in physics that like is, a, is sort of supportive for your work um, in the way that, I don't know, I'm imagining it like the mathematician who is a realist about numbers or something and is like, look, that just works for me. I have to think about them as being real, like as being abstract objects that exist. Uh, and there... I think that's not really philosophy. It's sort of an answer. I mean, it's a philosophical answer, but it's not a philosophical inquiry there, right? It's in a way the whole, the inquiry is like uh, cut short in favor of an answer that sort of like is works and is supportive, which is fine, but I, I, I'm not sure that that is actually philosophy. Uh, so, I think we can move on to the next question. It was from Sophia Stone, but she has... Uh, okay, so Sophia still wants to ask something. You can unmute yourself and... Me now? Yep. Okay, good. Uh, 
So I want to press a little more on Agnes's idea of universal philosophy and that we should all be able to philosophize. To me, it seems like there is a real contrast between the professional philosopher and who counts as a philosopher. And so it seems like children are natural philosophers. They ask questions that sometimes don't have answers to and they're really complex questions. Like is the, need, is the nature of the universe expanding or contracting? Uh, um, there, there's, all, there's all kinds of questions that, that, that children will ask that it touches on uh, a philosophical bent. Um, Oprah Winfrey sometimes can get really philosophical in her comments. She'll, she'll, she says one time, she says it uh, over and over again, that when you know better, you do better. When you think better, you do better. And that seems philosophical to me. And it seems like over our history, there have been leaders, maybe Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. or Frederick Douglass, who have waxed philosophical sayings have been really philosophical in their speech, but have not been recognized by the discipline to be a philosopher. And so with this universalization of philosophizing, are we going to lose something of the professional philosophy or uh, are we just going to have to expand our notion of who is a philosopher and what counts as philosophy? Thank you. It's a great question. And I don't know, like, I don't know what would happen to academic philosophy if everyone were a philosopher, right? Maybe it wouldn't exist anymore. Um, uh, to, to be clear, I don't think just that everyone should be able to philosophize. I think everyone should philosophize. Um, so it's kind of like literacy, right? We don't just want everyone to be able to read. We actually want them to read. Um, we don't just want everyone to be able to speak, right? It's actually the doing the thing that's, that's important. Um, so yes, we want everyone to have the resources and then we want them to use the resources and actually do the thing. Um, I think, I, I sort of feel like, I mean, Sophia, you've really touched on sort of what moved me to, in, in the formulation of this question. My thought is, the only thing that could explain the way in which philosopher is this is this fought over category is that it is supposed to belong to everyone. And so then there's like this problem of the non-recognition of someone as a philosopher. But that it is supposed sometimes I think the idea that it's supposed to belong to everyone is conflated with the idea that it already somehow does belong to everyone, right? That would be like saying at the time when only 1% of the world was literate, actually everyone is literate. And it's like, no, not everyone's literate. Um, they should be, but they're not, right? So it belongs to everyone in a way, but that doesn't mean everyone's already a philosopher. Um, and so then in this, we live in that time and it's the time of contentiousness, right? Because this thing that should be of everyone is not everyone's. And so there's this, there's this inclination to claim it. And that inclination to claim it is a manifestation of the understanding that it belongs to you in a sense of belongs to you. Um, so that, that's helpful because this is this is this is the sense in which I meant my answer to be an answer to the question: Why is philosopher uh, a disputed category? It's like it's a disputed category because we are living in a time of transition. Was my thought. Well, I I think it's a, it's a really interesting question, and I I do think uh, for, sort of from my vantage point, it does seem that one of the ways in which the philosophy profession is, resp is responding to uh, questions along the lines of, of yours, Sophia, nice to see you by the way, um, is uh, by indeed expanding the, the canon. Uh, and so we, we have seen uh, an influx of different uh, kinds of voices that haven't traditionally been thought of as philosophers in, in this, typical Western history of philosophy type class or a philosophy, a philosophy curriculum at a Western university. Uh, and I think we, we've seen, so, so I do think philosophy is, philosophers become more friendly to the idea of seeing philosophy outside where it's typically practiced. Uh, what that means for professional philosophy in the long haul, I don't know. I do have concerns about this idea 
uh, this sort of saying everyone can do philosophy. I, I do think that in some ways that uh, devalues expertise or has is, there's a risk of, of devaluing expertise in a way that uh, might be damaging to professional philosophers, but that's a different, that's more of like a vocational professional kind of uh, concern rather than a concern about philosophy itself. Uh, one just one question that I have in a way is prompted by what Agnes said, maybe she wants to respond. So philosophy, you say, you know, in a way belongs to everyone, but do you say the same thing about physics, biology, medicine, engineering, do they belong to, I mean, all these things affect everyone, right? Physics is relevant to all of us, biology is relevant to all of us, right? So I'll agree with that, but I guess I want to know why the why philosophy belongs to everyone. Um, in a way, I'm not going to answer. I just have to yeah, run, <laughs> so I'm sorry. Oh. But someone else answer on my behalf. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Oh, Slim. <laughs> uh, Professor Berg, would you like to uh, answer on behalf of Professor Collard? <laughs> I'm going to give an answer that I don't think Agnes would have would have given and I have to say, I'll preface by saying I'm actually very very uh sympathetic to the concern I'm I'm a mm. bit of a curmudgeon about philosophy and public philosophy and I'm just in general a bit of a curmudgeon so I'm very I'm very protective of the of the category and I think we really need to you know we'll, we'll lose something so special about the activity if we think you know everyone can just should sort of um, take on the name but I'll say something else and it's this counter example that I always am reminded of and that's sort of maybe telling the lie to my own um, dispositions, which is, which is ultra Orthodox Jewish societies are organized as a whole um, around the idea that everyone, but by everyone they mean men, but everyone should be able to study. And in fact, those societies putting, I'm just gonna put the, the gender inequality aside, but those societies are organized about anybody who's capable and that, that capability is really, that's generously perceived is spending their whole day and their whole life, in fact, in study. It's an exceptional state not to be a scholar, but to be to not to be a scholar. Um, and, and, and I'm always reminded of that. And, and this, the thought is that, that this society is constantly adjudicating and asking the fundamental questions at its basis. And sort of everyone more or less is doing that. Um, now, there are a lot of problems like who, you know, where, how does this society sustain itself materially and, um, and the, that imbalance that I mentioned before, um, and what are the people who can't study do? But it is possible to have a society in which, um, in that case, is sort of the study of the law, but one that raises a lot of philosophical questions is inc incredibly more central than what we have right now in our lives. And in another conversation I was having recently, we were thinking about, you know, thinking about the idea of, I don't know philosophy, but public thinking um, and the kind of potential it has to be um, universalized um, by analogy to things like the way we think of therapy today, right? We have therapy in the workplace. You have group therapy, you have individual therapy, you have people doing therapy six times a week on a couch. We have people doing it on their apps. Um, and some of those forms are good and some of the forms are less good, but we think of it as something that everyone, when they need it, when they want it, when they can do it, they, they should have some form of access to it. It comes in a million different ways. And I definitely think there's some form of public thinking. I don't know about philosophy, but public thinking in general is something that we can, um, think about is much more capacious than we do today. Um, uh, I think sports and the way, you know, we have professional team players, but we also have collegiate sport and we have taking a walk in the afternoon. We're constantly thinking about ways of exercising our body. I think we can think of ways of exercising our mind in a similar way. Thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, we have run out of time, uh, but I'm not sure if you would like to take another five minutes for a last question from Maria Elena. Would that be okay? Uh, okay, thank you, <laughs> Maria Elena. Yeah, I, I don't think the question is that new, so I think that indirectly you have already responded to that, but I just meant to frame it in a different way. Um, I was thinking of a short piece by Timothy Williamson where he was saying popular philosophy and populist philosophy, and he was distinguishing two models of doing public facing philosophy. So, the one model you just have this. Uh, you do research in academia and you only communicate the findings of this research to this uh, outsiders and this is all you're doing and then this this other model where you what you're doing when you're engaging with the public is really transforms the practice of philosophy itself and perhaps the place where this new philosophical knowledge is produced is outside academia and 
She was saying that, yes, the second model is bad because it's populist. It's really this idea that we should have disdain for experts and expertise. And it seems to me that you are advocating neither nor. So it seems to be that you are advocating a model where uh, public intellectuals should some, be doing something more than just uh, 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 communicating the uh, findings that were um, attained within academia. But then again, you don't have to have, you don't want to have this populist uh, style. But um, so it seems like the idea is that everybody should philosophize, but in an ideal society, not the society we have now. Is that right? Or I, I was anyway, I would be interested to hear any comments on that. Okay, well, I'll, I'll speak first uh, to that. Uh, so I, I think if the kinds of social changes that, that you know, in the United States, I can't speak directly to what's happening in Greece, but, uh, you know, over the last 70 years, uh, you know, about uh, historically marginalized populations, uh, people who didn't have a voice in institutions and society coming to have a voice is that those within the institutions uh, should be very um, cautious about claims to knowledge regarding things like people and people's experiences when those people are not being listened to and those people's experiences are not being uh, heard from when those people are not part of the conversation, right? Uh, we shouldn't be so arrogant as to think that the small sliver of people who happen to occupy uh, for various economic or sociological reasons, positions of official inquiry where we get to spend our days doing this kind of thing are the only ones who have something valuable to contribute about the kinds of inquiries here. So I think there's a great value in philosophers talking to non-philosophers and philosophers bringing philosophical questions to non-philosophers, uh, not just for the non-philosophers, but for those doing the philosophy. We can learn about other people's experiences, other problems that we might not have in virtue of the kinds of people we have historically tended to be. Uh, so I think, you know, we, we, there's definitely a lot to learn there. Uh, I do think that philosophers who have as their day job being philosophy professors, uh, they are experts, they are trained in a certain way, and there's a level of inquiry uh, and um, activity that they are engaged in that is not currently the kind of thing that ordinary people can embark on. Uh, and so when we say everyone can do philosophy, we do have to be somewhat careful about what we mean by that. Everyone can do philosophy in the way that anyone can sort of bang on a piano, right? Anyone can bang on a piano, anyone can play piano, that's all that counts, right? But if we mean that everyone can do philosophy as well as philosophy needs to be done, well, not yet they can't. Maybe in, maybe in the, the, one of the worlds that Anastasia imagined, or maybe if this transformation that Agnes talked about happens, then maybe at that point. But right now, yeah, okay, fine. Let's let people bang on pianos and, and drums and stuff like that. And maybe some of them will become musicians and maybe we'll learn from talking to people and that's all great. But we do have our expertise to protect as Anastasia, I think, mentioned. So thank you for the question. Um. If I may add, well, first of all, I have to say, I think that the first part of what Justin said is a great argument for why philosophers should go and listen to the public. I'm not entirely sure if it's an argument for why philosophers should go and speak to the public, which is that, you know, they might not know what they're talking about when they try and talk and generalize over experience. So I, I want to first say that. And secondly, I want to say, I don't think a good world is a world in which um, everyone is constantly doing philosophy, because what is wrong with us that we'd have to always ask you know, what, what is, is even knowledge? What is, is you know, what is being? Um, and is consequentialism right or deontology? And I, I can't even, you know, forget knowing what to do. I don't even know what the, what the uh, systems of, or sort of what, which philosophical moral approach is the correct one. That sounds like a, like a world that's even worse than the one I described where we just don't know what to do and constantly have to step back and, and ask questions. So I definitely don't think an ideal is one in which we're, you know, asking sort of deep epistemological questions every day. Otherwise we can't, you know, we don't even know who to believe or what to do. Um, and I do think, and I have another thing to say about the populism, which is I think that there's a lot of danger in public philosophy. One of them is this, um, is, you know, I like to think of it as public philosophers, you know, just expanding their undergraduate class 
but I always say, you know, when you have, when you're teaching undergrads, they're, they're captive, you know, they're holding them hostage in a way and you can, and you can, you can, you know, they have to listen to you, but, um, and I said, this is an editor of philosophers try to speak to the public. No one has to listen to you just because you're interested in your topic does not mean everyone else is interested in your topic. Um, and then another thing that people do when they do do undergraduate lectures is that they do op eds. They say, I'm a philosopher, so I know, so I'll tell you what to think about this or that issue. And so I think there are a lot of problems with it. Um, I think for now, putting that far away ideal aside, I think what's, I think what philosophers could do is quite modest, but incredibly important. And it's, preparing you for those moments of crisis, right? At first, I, I said in my, my question, I said, you know, there's something wrong when you have to step back and think. There's something wrong when you have to question your fundamental assumptions. And that means something is not right in the world, but something is not right in the world. No one thinks this is the ideal world. And I think philosophy allows us in the, on the individual level to stop for a second um, and, to, and, to, and to know how do I kind of precisely and accurately and carefully question an assumption when I have to. Um, and I think that's sort of all it can do, but that's sort of a tremendous thing that it can bring and help people do. I want to thank everyone from, uh, for coming and uh, Professor uh, Weinberg, Professor Berg and Professor Carlos for accepting our invitation. It was a lovely conversation. I enjoyed it very much and I wish we could have the opportunity to listen to you more often. We can follow you on Twitter as I have uh, <laughs> sent the uh, message on the chat and you can also uh, join Professor Callard for the talk she will give here again. So thank you very much for once more. Um, you can all clap. It will be nice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Janice. Thank, 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 you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>